Wait. Oh, hello, it's funny. <laughs> Good thing I have the ear fuzz in. Yeah, because <laughs> if it helps. <laughs> oh, yeah, and this All is right. most definitely getting into the episode. Ah, trust me, <laughs> that will be great. So let's do a quick introduction because the first time I have two people on, on the podcast at the same time, and remember, it's a video cast. So yeah, everything that you do, move, sneeze or whatever, it's going in. So ah, try to be <laughs> in the center of the camera and smile. Um, Wendy, how about yourself? You have a very interesting background and you, I would say, you know, from Duck Creek to the big solution that you're trying to, sorry, solving nowadays. Can you, mm -hmm. can you start us off here? Yeah, so just a little bit of background. Um, I actually started as a software engineer, as a software developer in the insurance industry. Um, so I used to write uh, software for underwriting systems uh, in the specialty markets. Um, and I never, ever thought I would be on the other side, you know, the dark side, the vendor side, um, when I was with uh, the carriers, because I didn't really have a lot of respect for that side of the house, to be honest with you. But I think the good news was when I met the guys from Duck Creek and I joined the team, I was the extroverted developer, so I ended up becoming business development, something I thought I'd never do in my life is on the other side versus writing code, eating Oreos and drinking Mountain Dew type of thing. Um, but, um, you know, what I what I loved about the job was the fact that I understood the problems. You know, I understood how to apply the technology. And um, and I from my experience on the receiving side, on the carrier side, you know, how do you work with prospects in a way that you're not, you know, bothering them all the time, right? Because vendors are a bother, let's be honest. Um, so, so yeah, so that's what I was. I, I am a software developer at heart. I haven't done it in a long time. Um, however, I, I love, you know, solving problems in the industry. I think it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun to get the industry to think outside their box in terms of, you know, how to make things better, streamline, you know, quicker, faster. It's, a, it's, it's fun. So I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. And now you're the CEO of Owit, Owit Global. Am I pronouncing that? Yeah. Correctly? Yeah. Yeah. So we started about four years ago. Um, there was a couple of us that came in from Duck Creek, uh, some other folks that are talented in the industry, a lot of insurance experience. And we wanted to solve some of the, um, the problems that were being ignored in the industry in terms of the underserved marketplace. Um, so we started to focus uh, heavily on border road management, Mm -hmm. um, which we have an amazing no code environment for uh, solving that ingestion of uh, cleansing, uh, normalization of data from uh, your distribution, whether you're a reinsurer or a carrier or you're an MGA sending the data. Um, and we also provide some other solutions that fill the gaps uh, to extend those legacy systems that people have invested in, whether it be um, no code environments for creating portals or rating or documents and things like that. So we, we cover a broad um, array of things, but what we do is we call it, we fill the gaps. That's what we say. We fill the gaps. You fill the gaps. Yeah. Barry, yes. how are you doing, man? I'm doing okay. <laughs> I'm doing okay. So what would put like someone like Wendy and me, a 35 year actuary that's, you know, working in the trenches, <laughs> working with numbers all day long, what would be the connection? And the connection is, you know, what Wendy just talked about with regards to border management. So I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a longtime actuary here with American National, and I'd worked in our standard division for 28, 29 years. And uh, about five years or so ago, I moved over to our specialty markets area. And specialty markets area here within the company is a big growing area, and it deals with MGAs. All of our business is produced either through MGAs or, you know, direct relationships with uh, finance companies, with furniture stores, that kind of thing. So we're taking a lot of data that's outside our own internal company admin systems. And what I came to find very quickly was, hey, in my old life, I never had to worry about issues with data integrity, you know, numbers mm -hmm. that are letters or letters that are numbers. And now all of a sudden mm -hmm. I come into a world where, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't look like it makes any sense. We don't write a $50 million building. Oh, it's not a $50 million building. It's really only 500,000, but the data came in badly. And if I had a nickel for every time I saw one of those things, I'd be a wealthy man. So 
having lived through several years of that and getting acquainted with Wendy and seeing what her her company had put together, you know, if, if, hey, as somebody that's an interested party and certainly a stakeholder, makes a heck of a lot of sense. And uh, I think as Wendy talked about, and I kind of can see, you know, like her vision of, hey, what we're dealing with now are more of these tactical issues, trying to, trying to cleanse data on the inbound. But the as she said, the longer term future, what does this look like? Carriers and reinsurers and TPAs mm -hmm. and MGAs are sharing data, you know, much more, you know, robustly than any time in the past. And as that continue, that's not going to change. It, that's just going to continue to ramp up. And as that does, that, that issue of being into sort of standardized platforms, because I think the sort of secret sauce of what Wendy is pitching is, hey, let's create a standardized pl platform. Before I ever even met Wendy, my first thing that I ever did within our specialty markets area, had a discussion with our, our uh, head of specialty markets. And we said, you know, the picture on the wall is the ability to be able to plug in or uh, out plug or uh, on board or off board an MGA in 90 days. And today, that's still a reach. And that's the biggest challenge that makes that a reach is, hey, we got to get electronically connected. And the, the friction that comes with trying to connect with a new business partner where you don't have a set of norms that you're working from. You know, we say, hey, it's, you know, carriers work with different MGAs. And to some degree, things are, are similar. But there's still there's still lots of differences, and the ability to onboard and offboard an MGA is still a struggle in our world. And when I see things like Wendy's pitching, I, I, to me that looks like the future. That's the way to get this more standardized to a point where hey, you can plug and play. You know, plug plug a new MGA in or offboard an MGA for a new product line. Have a standard set of protocols that have here's the here's the data layout and have it something that's easy to plug into, you know, that, that to me is the secret sauce that she's talking about here. So mm -hmm. before we go back to that, what are we missing in all, in order to plug in an MGA and to make it in less than 90 days or sorry, reaching 90 days, what do you need? What type of data do you need to do that? Well, it's not so much the data. I think it's the standardization yeah. of the approach that I okay. know that if I'm going to do product X, that mm -hmm. that product's going to carry with it. Hey, here's the in the industry sort of establish a set of industry norms that say here are the 120 variables that are going to come with. You want to deal in the world of product X. Here's the standard out out you know outlay of what that that information exchange is going to look like. You know because carriers then can readily you know there's there's a there's a benefit for both sides and that's what i think makes this something viable if you're the mga it makes it easier for you to go shop another carrier if you want because there's a there's a cost today of hey if i'm an mga and i've got a relationship with carrier x and i'm maybe not so happy with their relationship with carrier x and i might consider going over to carrier y uh, i might think twice about it because hey bringing on a new carrier and signing and, and going through that process carries with it some friction. You know, in this world mm -hmm. of the future, if that's all standardized, that's a level of friction that disappears and it makes it more easy. It, it, it makes it an easier shopping experience for the MGA and truthfully for the carrier as well, because it makes it easier so, for me to go recruit another MGA if I want to. Mm -hmm. So that's internally. We're already familiar with the code form. So that's sort of an industry standard uh, for better and worse. Right, it's more for uh, I would say filling out forms XML format, but it doesn't matter for this for this conversation. Uh, so that will take it more into the backend and connecting and working between MJ and carriers. Am I close enough? Cool. So let's talk yeah, about more. Yeah, about, I mean, yeah. And, and and also the reinsurer side too. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, the reinsurers have carrier relationships and they're receiving data, you know, from them. So it's it's a big ecosystem of data exchange. So I think Barry was going to say something there. But, no, yeah, like I, um, I, it's it's not just carrier MGA, but it is really any of those TPA, business partnerships. Right. Exactly. Right, 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 right. And the other thing, you know, you mentioned Accord. I mean, Accord really doesn't, Accord standards doesn't play a role in this. It, no. You know, I, no. it's, it's a, it was you know, just a uh, MGA. Of an 
industry st standard, which is not really a standard. Right, right. There is no industry standard here. We're talking about different MGA systems that come in, carrier goes out and says, I want you to use my template to send me the data. And they said, well, I have my own template, you know, and so it goes back and forth between the business people. And eventually the business guy on the carrier says, fine, just give me what you got. Right. And so then you're not necessarily getting all the data you need and, and whatnot. That's kind of how that goes around because people want to do business, you know, in this ecosystem. Um, and in insurance, data is gold. It's the most protected thing. People still feel uncomfortable. Even inside the organization, it's so siloed that they don't know how to share the data. How do you bridge those internal silos, or to be precise for this case, external in making sure that there is a standard, a standard or that the data is clean? Is that part of the gap that you're coming to fill? Yeah, so, the, the, so what we're filling is we're not having people necessarily have to standardize, right? So we're taking any file type, and we're, you know, we're taking the data out of that file type so that if it's Excel or fixed format, you know, we're working on a PDF format, uh, ingestion of PDFs. So for us, you know, if people, it's, it's really hard to get people to change. And so our solution will support, you know, what's out there right now. Well, now, will that change over time? Potentially, maybe there are more standards that people will change. But if you've been in business for so long and you're creating files that you're sending to your carry to your partners or whoever it might be, you're going to be sending. This is how we do it. This is what we do. This is what we send. Right. And so a lot of it's the, the pain points are not just in the end result of the data. When when Barry gets a hold of it, when he has to look at the data or send a report to the board or whatever he needs to do. You know, it, the pain, a lot of the pain points have to do in the operational side and how much pe money people are spending, looking at the data, manually entering it, going back and forth with the partner saying, this one's missing, this isn't right. You know, there's that loop of going back and forth, asking you to fix it, to fix it. And then what happens is because of the loop, the data doesn't get into the system on time. You know, maybe it's a month late when it needs to be in the system during the month of March, it gets into the system in the month of April. There's all of these other ancillary issues that come out of this um, outside of just data integrity and it costs the carriers lots and lots of money they probably don't spend enough time evaluating how much money they spend on people fixing and input inputting and do whatever they do and then they're going to expand and create more business and have more mgas and, and just you know keep adding you know to that to the to the cost is really what it comes down to i mean it's it's big it's a really big, expensive problem that we have. Barry, anything to add on that? I, I mean, it's, it, I, you know, yeah. Wendy, Randy so. really speaks from the perspective of, yeah, you know, that's the, the carrier. I mean, we've had a numerous discussions on this topic that there is a lot of the, that frictional cost that comes with every month trying to, hey, this particular file, there's some issues with it. And as she correctly points out, you know, we've seen that sort of, roller coaster of, hey, six months after the fact, why was March so much lower in premium than April? Right. Oh, because we didn't load this file because we had to process financials and I couldn't wait any longer. So it gets in there the next month. So you you wind up seeing a lot of things that, you know, there's that, that wind up generating internal friction after the fact, you know, and it certainly causes issues with when you have, let's say, preset metrics <clears throat> where you're doing measurements, many times you can draw incorrect, you know, flawed, flawed conclusions to, hey, what you think is a trend, which is really just, hey, this was a data issue that you were, you know, that you didn't process something properly or some data was skewed or flawed at it, as it came in and it didn't get caught in time and maybe was rectified in a subsequent month. So it causes that sort of hiccup up and down where you see, you know, if I take a look at a trend line, hey, what happened in that month? Oh, okay, somebody's got to remember that or, you know, with, there's, so it causes that, that's, there's an internal friction that comes with that. Right, right. And it's interesting, I mean, I think um, some, some of our prospects are becoming very proactive. Um, they're looking at, you know, growing books of business and they know they can't do what they're doing. So they're, you know, so we're having those kind of conversations. Um, 
And on the reinsurance side, you know, it's just, especially for these large global reinsurers, we're having a conversation with a large global reinsurer now. We just signed one um, this past month, but they just can't keep up with the effort to, to fix the data. It's, it's, it's just too massive of a problem. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, the data integrity problem has existed in our business forever. You know, and I think we were talking a little bit about this before. It used to be very internal. Your policy system, your data entry, okay, we're putting this into the system. We, I mean, when I worked on the insurance carrier side, we had a, our, you know, our data entry people, and we had a lot of data integrity issues in our own system, right? And now we're beginning to look out and expand and take other people's data problems. <laughs> we're just like ingesting their data problem, right? So now their data problem becomes part of our data problem, so it's bigger. Um, and then as we grow and start talking data, you know, data, you know, to do everything, transactions, mm -hmm. everything amongst ourselves, and then eventually bringing in potentially things like blockchain and whatnot, the data integrity issue is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So it's it's just time to pay attention to it. Everyone's been so focused on policy, billing, claims, policy, billing, claims. And this is, it's time to pay attention to this problem. Yeah, I think so. that if we consider data as the blood of the insurance or the secret source really depends for which company, um, it's just going to increase, right? To the, as you mentioned earlier, it's the data was all about the policy and the underwriting. And now there is more and more data that is coming in, especially for a exotic products, as uh, Barry mentioned earlier, which we're going to need more data, which is new data, completely fresh. As individuals, we are generating so much data, right? From the phone, one, two, three phones. Uh, uh, I don't know, you have a watch, you have a Fitbit, you have a, a, an O-ring, whatever that mm -hmm. may be. We are generating so much information. Our cars, of course, the smart homes, etc., all the IoT devices. Mm -hmm. But even with that, we are also having more and more parties to share it, uh, if we like it or not. But, and I'm talking about as an insurance company, okay, you're now working with the TPAs, you're working with underwritings, underwriting, all the different folks need to be part of that fold. And that's increasing exponentially the, the data well, uh, accuracy and, and, and reliability. And when you're Gilead, when you're on, uh, when you're on the pricing, the actuarial side, a big part of my role is you take a look at this data and tell me where do you see opportunity here maybe it's a if maybe it's an existing product line hey maybe there's a different way to price this product that we're not thinking about right now mm -hmm. that you know proverb builds the proverbial better mousetrap i can't do that if i don't have clean data coming in the door and what i typically see and i'm and i'm sure wendy sees this at other carriers is there's a lot of emphasis in a carrier environment to be able to there's certain essentials that you have to do on day one i got to be able to produce financial statements so that puts a that puts a priority on mm -hmm. certain data elements okay and but what a lot of the work that i'm doing maybe it's working with other with other metrics regarding some of that business that aren't necessarily financial metrics, those get less attention paid to them. And those are the ones that are, you know, in, in the, in the zeal to be able to produce the financials every month. Those are the ones that are, you know, looked at with less of a scrutinized eye, if you will. And they don't get their level of, of rigor around, Hey, is this valid or not? I'm looking for numbers here. They should be between zero and 10. And I see 100 there. Well, a lot of carriers don't have steps in place to make sure, Hey, is this reasonable? What's coming in the door? Is this a valid zip code? Is this address a, a reasonable address for the state of California? You know, is that zip code a California zip code or not? So a lot of those things that occur today as somebody that's going to use a lot of that detail information for more mm -hmm. sophisticated pricing metrics, you know, you start to see, you know, unearth a lot of these warts that come in that data. And that's where something like Wendy's solution, you know, is, it takes steps to kind of resolve some of those issues that are there. And I, and I, and I see that happening more and more. Yeah. 
So Wendy, finally have the question because I had like a very, very long preamble and then I'm going to leverage uh, Barry's uh, answer statement here. This is, this is where we're going, more data, bigger problem, exponentially mm -hmm. bigger in terms of data integrity. How are you going mm -hmm. to face or how are you going to help in the future handling that, especially when it's just exponentially going to be bigger? Yeah, so a um, couple things, um, you know, right now, like border on management is just a subset of the superset, right? But you have to focus on something and solving something first. And um, and so border on management, when you're solving that, it's not just an, what they call an ETL, extract, transform, load tool, which there are tools like that that IT folks use. It's all about you know, policy management, you know, the, dealing with the policy data, the claims data and the cash reconciliation, dealing with contract management. Um, you know, there's a variety of different things that you do within Bordero that have to are insurance specific. Right. So that's the that's the, the focus is the, is the Bordero management side of it. The bigger the bigger opportunity is using the same types of tools and building out more um, insurance capabilities for data exchange and other processes or transactions across the insurance business. So, you know, we have portals, you know, the, that people go to to put data into. And at some point, you know, it might be that there'll be ways of sending data to one another that we don't require those portals anymore. And so we'll be exchanging data. Let's say various companies sells product A, but they also want to sell product B, but it's not part of their appetite. So they find a partner in a different carrier to sell that product. So how does that happen? So Barry gets all the, 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 um, the, the submission information, quotes up his product, and then the data goes out to another carrier to get a quote for a different product, which complements it, you know, some sort of a package of some sort. Um, and that's a data exchange that changes the way that we do business. We partner with each other and we have to send data back and forth. But if Barry's system sells, sends bad data to the other guy, he's not necessarily going to provide a good user experience to the, the end user who needs to, you know, to get the quote. So, so that's just an example of one way. And as, as we begin to take, you know, these uh, data entry you know, place the data entry um, approaches out and we start to strip data off of forms, of documents or all the different types of things we do. It's all going to be data exchange and it's 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 the superset, the superset. It gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And at times, you know, we're at, at some time we're going to be we're going to be communicating this way. So the, the 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 message is that people need to pay attention to this now because it just becomes a bigger problem. And it's not just a bigger problem with data integrity, but I think it becomes a bigger problem because people can't play. You can't play in the space, you know? Um, and maybe that's okay. Maybe not everybody wants to play in the space, but it's gonna become, you know, that's where all these insure techs are coming into the, yep. into the, you know, the industry. They have all of the right technologies to send data, clean data, whatever it might be. Um, you know, that's where people lose their edge. And maybe what a carrier does is they buy the insure tech so that they have the, the technology, you know, but but it's it's going to be bigger. It'll probably be bigger than us when when Barry and I are retired, yeah. which, you know, <laughs> who knows when that would be. But hopefully not too long. <laughs> it's funny when you start to see all the people that you used to work with retiring. It's like, what? <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. So it's, it's all, you know, I don't know what your definition of insure tech is. Um, you know, for me, the insure tech was always a, a insurance um, insurer of some sort that had great technology. Mm -hmm. They were streamlining the process. That's what I thought insure tech is. Some people think insure tech is a vendor. I mean, Barry, what do you think? Uh, you know, it it's is? a little of both because I I, yeah. I I tend to agree with Wendy in that yeah when when I first heard that term 
I thought, hey, it's a it's a it's a lemonade. It's you know, it's a it's somebody that's that's doing traditional insurance, but are bringing a, a level of technology to it that is unseen maybe in the industry. Now, you know, when I hear that term insure tech and we've got an internal group that just looks at these kinds of things, it is a lot of vendors. I've seen numerous ones on the claim side trying to make the claim process more streamlined and more uh, squeezing every last dollar out of that claim process to ensure that you're running as efficiently as possible. So that's, and, and utilizing technology to the fullest, whether it's, whether it's, you know, uploading pictures, whether it's, you know, any part of that whole claim process, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I've been party to seeing some of those different co companies that have very, really creative approaches to, again, just building a better mousetrap and using technology to do it. Who do you recognize as a competitor or some sort of an overlap? Because my understanding uh, be between the data integrity also provide low code. So there are all kinds of players in that space from Appium to Pega to all kinds of those stuff. Sure, and sure, are dealing sure. With data enrichment, there is Carpi Data, Planck, and many, many others from Verisk, etc. right? So where are you positioned in the space? So, um, so this is, this is, um, I had this conversation with one of the analysts today about the no code, low code thing. Mm -hmm. So to me, no code, low code is just a new generation of technology, Okay. right? Yeah. Technology changes all the time. So a year I said to them, talk to me in a year or two from now, and maybe no code won't be the conversation anymore. So basically it's all be it's around a artificial intelligence. Yeah. So it's just, What's that? so basically it's, it's just a buzzword like AI ML. It is a buzzword, but it is a way of applying technology. So for example, we are re-architecting all of our tool sets. We're all no code. Um, but you know, when we finish, you know, the, the, you know, the, um, the, the team is creating a new architected version of the of the tools, but not as a me too, right? No, not just another no code environment, something that's, you know, you know, is it more advanced, right? So, so there's all different levels of low code, no code. Um, a lot of it has to do around the user experience in terms of how are you solving your technology problem? Right? Is it easy to use? Is it drag and drop? No code. Is it a Duck Creek Technologies configurator? That's more low code because it's complex and it requires technology, right? So it's a little different than that. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, I think it becomes more of a buzzword because it really is like we are a, we built our products on insurance specific microservices, which is a modern technology, right? Mm -hmm. It's like little components that all work together to create solutions. And then you can use those components to fill the gaps, as I talked about before, right? Um, but people don't buy a lot of times based on microservices, they buy based upon solution, right? So they wanna have a, 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 a solution that allows them to do the work themselves without having to have the dependency on IT. Right. So for the MGA, onboarding a new MGA, processing an MGA border row, all no code. Right. And so um, and so that's that's what that's what we provide. Um, so I think that there's a lot of it, depending upon when someone comes into the business and providing solutions there, they are going to have either a low code or a no code. Or maybe it's going to be, you know, read your brain what you're thinking code. I don't know what the next thing is going to be. <laughs> um, but I think there's, the, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of different types out there. But at the end of the day, I think people are looking to be self-sufficient. Um, and I also think that they also want solutions that work. So if it's a low code and it's not a no code, but it does exactly what it needs to do. Right. And it gets you to market quickly and it costs the, the price point is right. Then why not? What? Right. Because, you know, what I'm saying, yep. does that make sense in terms makes, of, you know, completely makes sense yeah. because there is always a trade off yeah. that you need to calculate in terms of how much, That's right. how much do I marry to this platform? What is the cost of development? Right. And will mm -hmm. that give me the results and the flexibility eh, three years, five years down the road, which sort of, you know, brings me to ask a question. So what do you think about the ecosystems? Because we've seen a Guidewire, Duck Creek, Majesco, mm -hmm. I think even Socotra 
uh, they're all building some sort of an ecosystem or it's uh, just simple plugins for external vendors or a platforms for internal yeah. or partners to develop on top of them. And they should. And I, you know, they should. And the reason why they should is because, you know, they become the older legacy systems. Mm -hmm. And in order to survive, right, I mean, ripping and replacing, as we've learned in the past, is just a very expensive thing to do, right? And it's crazy. So if you can, if you can allow other vendors to build on top or connect and do extend those systems, which is, we, which is what we do, we extend those systems, then that's better for the customer. Right. And so and it also it helps those vendors like the guy wires, the duck creeks. They're massive investments. Yeah. You know, people shouldn't have to replace those. It's they become good back end core systems. And then what happens is all the other pieces that work around it, you know, do other things and then put the data in there or, you know, um, or, you know, help them, you know, with something that's, you know, that's not that's not in their wheelhouse. So I think what they're doing is smart, right? In terms of allowing those other vendors to connect and, and to be part of the ecosystem. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't plan for everything. Of course not. And you can't be everything to everybody. So the way you do it is you provide value by bringing in partners. And so that what they're doing is the right thing. Fantastic. With all those, and with all those partnerships, be, just increase that amount of data going back and forth. That those data exchanges, yeah. <laughs> that, that's yeah. that's really oh, yeah. you know what I'll see as from the carrier perspective with the 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 preponderance of TPAs and, and not just MGAs and TPAs, but these little micro providers of services for solving a business problem. You know, like a Wendy's happens to be Bordero, and that was what my interest lied in. But there are similar like setups with claims or maybe on the underwriting side, some of the things that we're doing in other aspects of my company on the underwriting side, using these little microservices that do something, you know, one small aspect of the underwriting process, but they do it really well and it adds value. That's where those, you know, like you say, the plug and play concept kind of comes into play. Mm -hmm. and you got to mm -hmm. have those systems to be able to attach those kinds of uh, improvements to it. Yeah. And the thing about, you know, the Duck Creeks and the Guy Wars is they, is they allow this whole ecosystem to revolve around them, like the center of the sun being the sun and everything's around it. You know, the other ones that don't do that, you know, you know, they, they, they stand the, the chance of being replaced or you know, or just being sunsetted over time. So it is. Yeah. Um, well, Guidewire is sort of considered the new legacy, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it's a question: Can you jump between one solar, uh, solar, uh, solar system to another solar system? solar system? Right. <laughs> and it seems to me that what you are providing is the ability to bridge between those solar systems and working yeah. With, yeah. with different systems. Because as we know, the bigger the carrier is, thanks to mergers and acquisitions. They have so many different policy administration systems, so many core systems, and they need to know mm -hmm. how to talk one to another. And usually they don't. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's all different ways of doing that. I mean, there's integration. People write integration. Um, their IT folks, you know, do integration. There's probably other integration companies out there that provide that. Um, but, but, but. There's a difference between integrating and having clean data when you're doing the integration. Yes. So that's the key. So that's why I said before, uh, we have an insurance company that uses us for border row, but they're also taking data out of different policy systems and using the border row um, uh, solution to cleanse the data and normalize it to send it to their back end ODS and do the reporting because the data is not clean from their own internal system. So that's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Fantastic. So. Okay, so we passed the 35 minutes mark, which with two people, and we hardly spoke on, on you know, we didn't really do a deep dive on, on anything in particular, except for data integrity. Um, I'll ask you, both of you, the same question that I'm asking everyone is the last question, which is, can you give us a recommendation? It can be a book, a movie that you've seen, a life hack, something mm -hmm. that you like to recommend. Mm -hmm. I, I, you want me go to ahead, Wendy. Or you no, go, go ahead, Wendy. 
Okay. It ha yours it has something to do with the Buffalo no, Bills, no, but no. that's okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, one of the things, so I, uh, in December before COVID in December, I had gotten a second master's degree in organizational behavior and part of my studies had to do, um, uh, with growth mindset. There's a woman named Carol Dweck who was out of Stanford university. Uh, she's a PhD who had done this study on, um, uh, children in school and whether they have what they call a growth mindset, the ability or the, the, the want to learn, make mistakes, learn from your mistakes or a fixed mindset, which would be more someone who's, I can fix this problem, but I'm not going to do that because I'm afraid to do it type of thing. Um, so anyways, the whole concept, the growth mindset uh, is uh, very important to me. I love it. I think we are working in an industry that is beginning to have a change over into a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Um, and so um, I would highly recommend uh, Carol Dweck's book on growth mindset because it's not just kids and education. It's about companies and turning companies around um, based upon the thinking, especially the leadership thinking and how, you know, people follow and how they can grow and, and, and make mistakes along the way to, um, to, to be better and to better organizations. So that would be my recommendation. Nice. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm yeah. going to take a different path. So it's so right. it, Buffalo no, Bills. No, I'll, I'll stay away. That's still a sore <laughs> subject. So I'll leave that one alone. But so it's mid February here in upstate New York. And it's the time of the year when you're pretty much getting sick of winter and you're in your you're about ready to hit a warm weather spot. But when you hey, live in this part down. of the <laughs> there, when you live in this part of the world, you got to find things to do in the winter time that uh, that, you know, that that. Uh, keep past the time and, and keep you interested in, in things outside of what you do every day for work. So this year, um, there was, uh, my daughters had gone up and seen here and, and uh, they're doing it in New York, up in Lake George, a beautiful resort area in, in Northern New York, but also in, uh, I guess they've got one of these in New Hampshire and I believe in Minnesota. So there's several of them and it's an ice castle. So it's, it's, it's a structure. It's, it is, it nice. is impressive to see. Um, you know, it's, it is like, it's like going to a museum, but it's all ice and you got to go in the winter time when it's obviously pretty cold out, but <laughs> it has something special to see. So, you know, for those that live in Northern climes, you know, if you see an, an, an advertisement for an ice castle, it is a thing of to, to, with, to, especially at night because they've got all kinds of neat lighting in it. So Ooh. it was a, uh, an experience where, you know, it, and it was, it was impressive to walk through what is a building, essentially like a small building made of ice with, uh, with, uh, a, with slides and benches and all kinds of mirror, awesome. mirror like rooms. It was a really impressive looking place. So, so, uh, for, if you're looking for something, does anybody dress up as Elsa? Uh, well, I, mean, it, I think it, it has <laughs> that kind of flavor to it, Wendy, but, yeah. uh, but it is a, it is a popular thing and, uh, you know, it's something that I would highly recommend if you're stuck looking for something to do on a cold winter day. Now I have to put that on my list. I love it. Right. Wendy, Barry, thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pleasure talking with both of you. It's like first time that I'm trying to join two people and it's not a panel in a conference, but actually in the podcast and trying to shut up when I yeah. need to shut up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank right. you. Thank you for having me. All right. Me. Thank you for having me Appreciate as well. It.